Hello and welcome to the second version of this. Those of you that looked on the YouTube channel earlier probably saw one of this uh, PowerPoint with no sound. That's because I'm an idiot. Now I've managed to get a recorder properly and we'll get this one done. And this one's quite an important one to me. Um, it's paper two, question four. And the reason it's so important is because it's probably the trickiest. Uh, it's tricky for teachers, it was tricky for students, not just in this school but across the nation. What I'm going to try and do in this presentation is to show you some tips and tricks to make sure that you can get the maximum amount of marks for it because actually you've got a lot to do in what's relatively a short space of time, just 20 minutes. So let's have a look at the assessment objective. So as you can see, it's AO3. You see there's a lot more uh, on the literature paper than you actually see on the language paper. Uh, and what you're looking at here is comparing writers' ideas and perspectives and how these are conveyed across two or more texts. So essentially, the most important part there is the first part, um, and then the second part will come, will come in a bit more later on. So the first thing that's important about this assessment objective is that it is compare. So regardless of which way, way you look at it, there has to be an element of comparison within your answer. So those comparative words that you've been looking at in your literature will come into play here. So making sure you've got a list of a good five or six comparative words that you'll make sure you're going to use and they'll be really, really important. The second part of this is also quite important here. So you're comparing the writer's ideas and perspectives. And that's really important because the majority of students aren't doing that. Majority of students are looking at the content. What you're doing is essentially trying to work out what does the, re the writer of a particular text feel? What's their emotions? What's their feelings? Can you find that? Demonstrate that? And if you can, well, then you get the first part of the marks for AO3. The second part, though, is also important, it's as well as how these are conveyed. And what that essentially means is, OK, so you've worked out how the writer is feeling about a particular subject, how are they showing that? And that comes down to language techniques or using structure again. So you're bringing in some of the skills you've already been using in this paper across into this one. And there is also an opportunity to perhaps repeat some of the things that you've said in earlier answers, as long as it pertains to the question that you've got in front of you. So we're going to be starting by looking at two papers today. We're looking at the Festivals and Fairs one, so the one that's set in Glastonbury and when Dickens went to the Greenwich Fair, and one that some of you did actually for your mock exam, which was the Welsh mining disaster, followed by um, London, by the London earthquake, which essentially wasn't really a big earthquake at all. These are the two that we've got. So if you've got these printed off and in front of you, particularly the passages more than the questions, then you'll be absolutely fine to do some of the techniques today as well. Get yourself a pen and paper as well, because I'd like you to have a go at some of these answers um, and when you finish them bring them in for your teachers to have a look at particularly if you've not done very well on these particular ones as well so question four this is what a potentially this is what it looks like here now in this one as you can see this is from the very first paper um, and this was probably the one of the more complicated ones mainly because uh, if you look at it it was the whole of source A but then it was only the father's letter to the family friend in source B I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this particular question just to show you that this was a this could be a possibility so if they've got a particularly large source um, like it was it was a letter from the son and then the father's response to that letter uh, they may ask you just to look at one part of it or a portion of it. Just be aware of that. That hasn't happened in any of the other practice papers, but I don't want to tell you that it's not going to happen just in case you're prepared for it. But as you can see, the main things here is this is what it will look like on the day. So you'll have where you to look for, you'll have the question which won't change very much, and then you'll have the three bullet points. And again, those three bullet points won't change as you go through. And as you can see, that's worth 60 marks. It's worth fewer marks than your traditional question for, like the evaluation question on paper one, because it's a harder question. So they took some of those marks off and placed them elsewhere within the paper. But you should probably still spend about 20 minutes on it because you've got a lot more to read and to pull out. So 20 minutes is a good time to spend answering this particular question. So as you can see here, with the bit that I've highlighted in red, you're always told uh, what's going to come up. And as I say, this one in particular was a bit confusing to students. I'm hoping that in the future AK aren't going to do this, but obviously we can't promise anything. So just be aware that you might be asked to look at a part of an extract, not the whole source. So let's have a look at this question. This is the one we're actually going to be doing a bit more detail today, and it's one that you've probably done quite a lot with your English teachers. So this is what the question, as I said, looks like. And there's actually a lot of information here. So the best thing to do is probably just to break this down a little bit and actually look at what the examiner is asking you to do. 
So let's take the first part. So for this question, you need to refer to the whole of source A with the whole of source B. Now I'm hoping that's exactly what you're going to get in the summer, so it will completely avoid any confusion. You know you can look at both sources and everything from the sources. So fingers crossed that's exactly what you're going to get, because we don't want to be bogged down with that. But just make sure you read that part, just in case they've thrown something in there, for example, just a part of source B or maybe the second half of source A. Just be aware that they can change that. Just make sure you know what you're looking for and you don't get caught out with that trap. Okay, so this is the second part of the question that's quite important. Compare how the writers have conveyed their different views and experiences of the festival and fellow describe. So that first bit, there's that compare again, that's the most important part. So you're comparing how the writers have conveyed their ideas. And as you can see there, it's about what are their different views and experiences. And that's really important there. So those the views and experiences are telling us that they don't want you to write about the content of what's going on. They want you to write about what the two different writers feel about their time at Glastonbury. What does Dickens feel about his time at Glastonbury Fair? And as you can see, the only bit that will change the question obviously is that last part there, festival and fairly described, because it depends on whatever text they've given you. But it's nothing to do with content, and I will go into that in a bit more detail. So in your answer, you could compare the different views and experiences. So that's the first thing that you definitely have to do. And you must be making sure that you say, right, this is what this person is thinking, and this is what person B is thinking. And that's where you use your comparative words. Now, you might find that some of the exam papers you get, they've got very similar viewpoints, and that's absolutely fine, because they might have. But the majority of the papers that we've looked at, they've got very different viewpoints and experiences from what's been going on. So if you consider on this paper, in Festival's Fair, she hates Glastonbury to begin with, but actually comes around to it right at the very end, whereas Dickens is a bit harder. My gut feeling is that he actually quite enjoys the hustle and bustle of it, but it could be read that it's actually he doesn't enjoy it as well, but I don't think there's a particularly wrong answer there because it's not made clear in the entire piece what his viewpoint is. But they're the viewpoints there, and you're just basically saying what their viewpoints are with a bit of evidence to suggest that, and that gets your first part of the marks. The second one's important here because this is actually reminding students what to do, and this is what so many students completely forget compare the methods that they use to convey those views and experiences. So this is where it's asking you to say, right, okay, well done, you've told me what the their viewpoint is and you've given me evidence to suggest that. There's some marks for you here. But what you need to do now is say, right, what different techniques have the writers used to get that viewpoint across? So has the writer used exaggeration? Has the writer used a simile? Has the writer used an interesting headline? What has the writer done to get his viewpoints across to you? And the last part of the question, support your ideas with quotations from both texts, that's a given, but you can't even get out of the bottom level if you're not using quotations from the text. It's really important that you get that done. And the final thing, just a reminder again, it is 16 marks, about 20 minutes you're spending on this particular question. There again, the question as a whole. So yes, it looks confusing. Yes, there's a lot of information there. But if you know that big chunks of it won't change, particularly the first part and the bullet points, then you're really focusing on the bit that's in the middle. That will give you your focus for the question. The bullet points are there just to remind you of how you want to structure your answer. So you can write your answer in three sections. So what I tried to do was to think of a an easy plan for students to be able to do this on any question, any time that they're going to do it. So I've tried to break it down into three ways. Number one, what is the view of the writer in Source A? What examples can you give to support this view? Is the writer's view of Source B the same or is it different? What evidence is there to support that? And that should be your first paragraph. Now in that, you're not actually putting in any methods whatsoever, you're just simply writing the viewpoint. And what I'm hoping you'll do is completely avoid just content. And your, your comparative words will come in the second part of that particular paragraph there, not the first part. And if you look at the mark scheme, well, you're already doing what it's asking you to do. You're hitting that assessment objective because you've started to compare and you're focusing on the viewpoints uh, and the perspectives of the different writers. Then you need to write about source A. So your second paragraph is just about source A. And this is where I'd like you to look at techniques. I think two should be enough. Um, three if you've got time. Essentially, right, okay, the writer uses a metaphor, the writer uses um, alliteration, the writer uses a rhetorical question, whatever it is. Give some examples and then making sure you're linking it back to the question. This is how the writer is getting their viewpoint across to the reader. So now we're hitting that second bullet point. But we're not doing any comparison in that second paragraph at all yet. 
the last bit of comparison will come in this final paragraph. Now write about Salisbury again and how the writer expresses their view through different techniques. Again, two would be enough. However, throwing in a few comparative words here will help, unlike source A, similarly to source A, in source A, however, in this source, and so on and so on. So you're not doing a huge amount, but essentially what you're doing is, and in my view, you're hitting all of the assessment objective and you should be able to get at least into the, those top level three into level four because you're doing everything here. You're writing about the viewpoint and perspective, you're picking out techniques that the writer has used and you're comparing them as well. So if you follow that, that plan, for any question you get, for any passage you get, you'll be absolutely fine when answering this particular question. So just to remind you, lots of writers' methods that you can comment on. You've got the descriptive techniques, You've got rhetorical devices, so things that you've been looking at all with your teachers throughout, exaggeration, lists, so on. Different sentence forms, of course, we know those are going to be quite important as well, and you've been looking at them in the language. The use of punctuation, particularly if you're looking at things like exclamatories, when they're, perhaps when the writer is really kind of overemphasizing a point, that would be quite good. But you can also write about headlines. Now, obviously, not all the passages will have headlines because they might not all be articles. But if there's a headline there and it's got an interesting technique being used in it, then you can write about it. And in a similar way, AQA are also telling us that if there's a picture there, well, the picture is part of the article and it's also telling the story. So you're talking about the picture is really important. So think to the Glastonbury one. You've got a picture of the woman, the reporter, who's standing in water up to the top of her Wellington boots, and she looks absolutely miserable. And the background looks really horrible. So that fits completely with the kind of tone of the the whole article itself and sometimes about the form as well so what is it that has been written and obviously will that help so for example one's an article and one's a diary well obviously that has a massive impact because one's written for an audience that's quite large and one's written for an audience of one so it's really important sometimes and you won't be able to write about it in every single example but occasionally the form will be important because it will affect the way that the writer is writing and of course the tone, and the tone's a really good one because it's normally quite easy to spot what the tone is and how the tone might change. And there might be a lot of similarity between the two articles when they're writing about the kind of the tone that's on them. Now remember, and this is really important, the question is asking you to prepare viewpoints, not content. I mean, I've been saying this all the way through this presentation, but it's really important I want to hammer this home. The average mark for this question at the moment around the country, and this is about 70,000 students at the last count, is about 6 out of 16. It's one of the lowest marked questions out there. And why is this? Well, looking at the data, looking at what students are doing, it's because most pupils are comparing the events of source A with the events of source B. They're treating it like it's a question two. Um, and sometimes they're even repeating some of the stuff they've said in question two. And that's not going to get you any marks. It's all about how the writer feels or what their experiences were. And that's what you need to focus on. And if you can do that, I guarantee you'll beat the average that students are getting for this particular question. So here's the question again. We're just going to have a look in a moment uh, of some example paragraphs of what I would write. So my advice to you now is have a quick look at the article itself and have a go at identifying uh, the viewpoints in both and have a go at identifying some of the language features as well. Um, give yourself a few minutes to do this. You don't have to write this particular question up, but just write a few things down and then have a look at my paragraph on the next few slides and to see whether you've got the same kind of stuff that I've picked out for it. So here's a couple of things that I picked out from Source A. Um, Anton is standing in knee deep in tea coloured water, so um, he's pretty miserable, uh, uh, obviously there. Uh, and she's talking to him, and he he seems happy, but she's certainly not happy at all. He's also covered in dark brown mud, and the simile there, like a gleaming otter emerging from a riverbed. She's obviously horrified by the dirt. And in the last part of that paragraph, he sweeps his arm and looking at the scene of near total devastation. So from that very first paragraph, there's at least three examples there where clearly she doesn't like what's going on there. Uh, the tents are being chased by a group of shivering half-naked people who look like the survivors of a terrible natural disaster. Again, another quotation leading into the sense that she doesn't particularly like Glastonbury. However, I've also included the very last quotation right at the very bottom where actually, even though she hasn't told us whether she's perhaps loving it yet, she's starting to come over. It's almost nice, this Glastonbury thing, because she's being drawn in by the atmosphere of the crowd. So the majority of the article is actually 
actually fairly negative. But the last part of the article, she does start to turn. So her attitude towards the festival does begin to change. And there's a few things there. And I wouldn't write all of these in my first paragraph because there's far too much there. So what I'll probably do is pick maybe two of these quotations to support the viewpoint. Maybe one of the positive ones at the beginning and then one of the negative ones at the end. So this is how I would write the first part of paragraph one. Have a read through this paragraph here and you can see that I've embedded my quotations but I've made it very clear that I'm not writing about content but I'm focusing on her viewpoint and perspective. Have a read through. As you can see, there's my embedded quotations. That's what I'd rather see than the old traditional kind of comma, quotation mark, full stop. Embed them with your answer. It will save you a massive amount of time in the long run. Now for the second part, this is where the comparative part comes in. So again, there are fewer quotations for this one because Dickens is a bit harder trying to work out his interpretation of it. Now there's been a bit of debate within our department. Some of the teachers think actually Dickens doesn't like it at all. Uh, it's quite rowdy and raucous and he's uncomfortable with it. And a few of the teachers, including myself, think he actually seems to enjoy it because he's been drawn into it and he's been pulled along and he seems to like all the bright lights and the, fa and the fairs. To be honest, you're not going to be penalised whichever way you pick because it, I don't think it is made clear in that entire article so I'm going to go down the route they actually enjoys it so everybody is anxious to get on and be at the fair okay we know that it awakens very different feelings could be seen as a positive or a negative the stalls are gaily lighted up so clearly he likes the stalls and how bright they are and obviously the contents there and then imagine yourself in an extremely dense crowd which swings you to and fro and again that could be seen as a positive thing because he's been drawn into the crowd and being taken along or it could be seen as a negative so it doesn't really matter what side of the argument you're going to be on so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take some of those quotations and put them to the second part of my paragraph. So it's the comparative of the viewpoint. And this is what I've done. So have a quick look through this particular one. Again, I've embedded my quotations. And you can see here, throughout it, I've used the unlike right at the beginning. So straight away, I've used a comparative word. So the examiner will tick that because here I'm comparing it um, to before. And I, actually, if I think you look at the whole thing, I think that's pretty much my only comparative word. But I'm still comparing them. Okay, so have a quick read through that. And again, there's my embedded quotations. Saves you time. You don't have to write big lengthy quotations and the examiner is going to award you more marks for it. And this is the whole paragraph together. So as you can see, the first half I'm writing about source A and then I've used the word unlike, started talking about source B and that's where I've got the comparison in there. And the whole thing is focused on viewpoint. It's not about content and what's going on. It's about what their views are of the festival or the fair. But we're not finished. That in itself will be fine and it will give us a few marks, but it's only hitting the first and the third bullet point, the viewpoints and then using evidence to support your answer. I haven't done anything about language yet. So if that's all I did, although that'll be enough for me to get out of level one into level two, that's pretty much where I'm going to end up. So it's about the techniques now that are going to be really important. So now answering the second bullet point. So again, go back to the passage if you haven't done so already and try and pick out maybe two or three different language features. Remembering what I said, it can be structural, it can be sentence forms, it can be headlines, it can be pictures, it can be descriptive, it can be rhetorical. Pick out two or three language features that you think are supporting the um, use of um, um, their, their viewpoint and that's helping you answer that. Once you've got those, then go on to the next slide and see whether you've picked out the same things. So here's what I've picked out here. Um, so a couple of things that I have picked out. The rhetorical question that was in the headline, because I thought that was quite good. The use of the image, because I thought that was important as well. And I've also then gone on to the simile. So I've picked three different examples. But as you can see, I haven't written loads. I've written a little bit of an analysis here, but I haven't gone into huge amounts of detail, mainly because I haven't got time. And again, I've embedded my quotations to make life easier for myself. So I have a quick read through that paragraph. And as you can see there, I haven't got done any comparison yet, because I'm just writing about the language techniques in source. A. Now he's uh, looking at my final paragraph and again it's a similar in length and you can see I've already started off with a comparative word in contrast to Day's sarcasm. So straight away again I'm showing the examiner that I am comparing between them and again I'm not comparing language techniques So one of the things that's really important I'm not saying one writer uses a simile oh look and this writer does as well because that's not really comparison um, and it's not really good comparison either because anybody can do that. What I'm doing here is I'm more looking at how they've expressed their ideas 
And if there is a similarity that seems very obvious and that seems linked together, so for example, if both of them were writing about how bright something was, uh, I might say that in the, in the writing in my answer, but none of them do, so I've just avoided it completely. So I'm focusing, as I say, completely here on just the kind of what this one does to kind of show me that it's positive. And as you can see, if you read it through, I've picked out there, I've got the use of a list, because as we know, Dickens loves a list. I've got the fact there's a simile there, and then the repeated images of light. And I didn't throw in a quotation there because I thought that's pretty self-explanatory. And again, it's not a huge paragraph. So if you look at all three of mine together, I think I've got everything that I need in there. So what I'd like you to do now for your go is I want you to download the Welsh Mining Disaster inserts. So you've got them both so when in front of you. So it's the Welsh Mining Disaster and it's the earthquake that happened in London. I picked this one on purpose because I thought this was quite a nice paper. One's very much um, about a, a much bigger disaster that was much more horrifying. Whereas the second one was almost uh, an earthquake that happened but very few people noticed it. So it's quite obvious there are different feelings and viewpoints towards it. So here's the question here again. So as you can see, the first part hasn't changed. And as you can see, the last bullet points haven't changed. So the bit that's important is the, the bit in the middle. Compare how the writers convey their different ideas and perspectives of the events that they describe. So it's very straightforward. What does the writer feel about the Welsh mining disaster? Well, the fact that hundreds of people died, including children, is obviously terrifying and horrible and disastrous and sad and pity. All those things are going to come through. Whereas the London earthquake one, well, we don't feel any of those things because nobody died. It did very little damage. And for the most part, nobody even noticed it. So you can already see that they're very very different passages so your job now what I'd like you to do is to find two or three quotations from both passages that support the viewpoints and then find me two or three language dis or rhetorical descriptive techniques that the writer is using to support those viewpoints and then put those into a paragraph for me or three paragraphs for me and then bring that in for your teacher to mark now, just very quickly, I just wanted to highlight something that's quite important here, and this is the mark scheme. This is the entire mark scheme that we get for that question. Just want you to have a look at this here, and I think you can uh, you can tell from it, we don't have a lot to go on. It's a lot down to the teacher's judgment. And what that means is, and why I think this is good, is if I think that you have made a valid point, even if I don't agree with it, but it makes sense and you use the right techniques, then I'm going to be awarding marks for you. Because as you can see there, that's very, very vague. It's one of the vaguest mark schemes of all the questions that are out there. There is no real indicative content that we can look at here. It's very much up to what we think and what we feel. And here's the second part. So it breaks the mark scheme down. So the first part was looking at more about the kind of the, the viewpoint whereas the second part is looking at the different techniques and again you can see here it's really really quite vague so hyperbole imagery scientific terminology vivid description uh, emotive language so you can see here that i don't have a great deal to go on it's just telling me the things that i can look for so it should give you a bit of confidence when going to this question that there is no definite right answer as long as you can argue the point and put it across in your three paragraphs then you'll be absolutely fine so, in terms of final revision, there is uh, lots of revision stuff that you've used for AO, I put AO2 there, it should be AO3, but there's lots of stuff for AO3 actually on the on Go for School, so that all you need to do is download that and give that a go, but I think the best revision would be to actually have a go at the question that you've just looked at, write it up, don't take any longer than the 20 minutes you've got for the exam itself, and bring it into your teacher, let us mark it, let's have a look at it, and let's see where you're going right, let's put make sure you've got it wrong, but remember, don't overcomplicate this question. Really, really important. Focus completely on writing about uh, the three paragraphs. Write in the first paragraph about their viewpoint and perspective. Second paragraph, write about source A. Third paragraph, write about source B. And then that's it. You've hit all the assessment objectives. You're doing everything you need, and that's absolutely fine. We're going to do one more language paper, uh, one of these presentation videos. We're going to do it on the London Snow paper. That'll be coming in the next few days. That's the exam that most of you did for your mock exam. Keep having a look for that, uh, and then you can kind of compare it to your paper, and you can see where you where you did it well and where you got any makes sure you need to repeat and be able to look at where perhaps you went wrong and what you need to do in terms of how to focus your revision. Alright, thank you very much. See you later.